thank you so much for, for inviting me. I'm so happy that you did. On behalf of AIMCSI, we really appreciate your time and your perspective on arthropnosis. So just to kind of go over your impressive resume, I know you serve as a politician, a lecturer, entrepreneur, um, your parent, and you're a former Paralympian. Congratulations on all you have achieved. <laughs> Thank you. And I would like to love to dive in a bit more. Mm -hmm. Starting with your childhood, I would love to hear about your upbringing and kind of how your family came to understand arthropnosis and how to understand disability. What was that like? Well, I'm 48 now, so I was born in a, in a different time. I was born in 1973, and the time then was, it was still quite few older people with AMC who actually survived birth and pregnancy, and, and so it was quite unknown, and I was very weak when I, when I was born. I couldn't move at all before I was six, seven months. I could move my head one, two degrees when I cl was closing up to a year. And the, the doctors told my parents that I would probably never even be able to sit up in my life. That was my verdict when I, when I was uh, seven, eight months old. Um, but it, it was a lot of training. I, I trained extremely hard. Physiotherapy every day when I was a child. Um, I think that today we're smarter. <laughs> we, we don't overtrain the, the way that many of us did when we were younger. For me, that was good. But for some other children, that was a disaster. So, so I think that training today is a bit more individual. Physiotherapy is a bit more individual. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I worry that we give up too fast today, that we don't train as hard as we could, that we don't reach as far. But, but for me, it was very good with, with a really hard training. But, but I, I hated physio. Uh, it was the worst <laughs> thing I ever did in my life. So, Quite early, when I was six years old, I started to negotiate with my physiotherapist. I, I remember vividly when, one day when I was six years old, I looked my physiotherapist straight in the, her eyes and said, what do I have to do to get rid of you? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and she said that I, I, I need to train, so go to sports. So I started negotiating with her to get rid of her one day a week, two days a week by exchanging physiotherapy to something else. So it was a lot of training. I'm guessing that experience kind of served as the catalyst into your Paralympic career, kind of giving that motivation and, and drive to be as well, yeah. as possible. I think for, for me and for most Paralympic athletes in my generation, when it weren't as much media as it is today, when sponsors weren't thriving as they are today, I mean, for us, training was about independence, not about gold medals. I, I never started swimming to become a world champion. That was a bonus <laughs> that came a lot later. I, I started swimming to... to learn how to move, to go stronger, to, to, to lose weight, to, to feel better, and to, that was the only reason for me. I, I was hearing your speech, um, I believe it was how to successfully integrate disability in your life. You established in that speech was every kid needs four things, love, encouragement, support, and subjective demands. I can kind of see where you're coming from in terms of your approach to disability, where every circumstance or every person needs to have a unique approach to how they will navigate a lot of those experiences. So that's something I, I truly appreciate. And um, I think um, you, ju you just said it very eloquently. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but that's how I kind of, um, kind of even approach my own disability. I think that's great to hear and thank you for, for sharing. Um, but but I, I really do believe that, that mm -hmm. you need support. But, but sometimes we give too much support when you have no demands to balance it up with. Let's say that you are my swimming coach uh, mm -hmm. for a second, and you say to me that I expect you to do this today. I can choose to interpret that as you are harsh, you are evil, you don't know my limitations, or I can choose to interpret that as, wow, Brandon believes in me. So it's not only about how you say something, 
it's always also about how I interpret it. Communication is two people every time. It's never only one. It's never only the other one's responsibility to say it in a way that I understand. It's also my responsibility to in try to interpret it in a positive manner. Definitely, because perspective really determines how you like see life overall. So I do agree with that. I also had another question. Growing up, when you're diagnosed with arthroposis, was it difficult to find a doctor who specialized in the disability? Well, Sweden total has today 10 million people, probably mm-hmm. a bit under nine when I was born. So it's like a small state <laughs> in the US. Nine million people, we, don't had, we didn't have any expertise on AMC. We had doctors who knew disability. They were also learning at the same time. I remember every year when I went to these annual checkups, we always called that I'm going to educate doctors <laughs> more than to actually get, get advice. It's the, the annual doctor education. But I, I also thought that that was important because if we who live with a disability like AMC don't teach and try to learn, uh, teach other people on, on how to better help us, how should they know? No, no one knows my disability better than me. And that's what, both one of the strengths with AMC, but also one of the disadvantages is that we all look different. I say it's a, both a strength and a weakness because we, we need to find our own way. And that also helps us define who we are. But, but it's hard to find an exact role model because they don't exist. And I don't know if you agree. Oh, I do agree. I think with arthroposis, um, I mean, I've come to learn that there are about 300 or 400 different varieties of the, of the disability. And yep. it's very hard to find someone who matches like a similar circumstance that I do because arthroposis affects my, my hands and my legs. However, I, I am able to be mobile, but um, yeah. we have AM, AMC people who are in wheelchairs who who can walk but can't use their arms and that sort of thing. So I, I do agree there's no like particular template for, for this experience. <laughs> no, exactly. And, and uh, I mean, we have, I think you have more movement in your arms than I do. My arms are completely paralyzed. Um, I would say that I have about 30% movement in my legs, but locked knees at a 90 degrees, uh, so I cannot stretch my legs either. So I invented my own wheelchair uh, when I was younger to, to pedal around. And my wheelchair has a small wheel. So I invented this like a tricycle with a wheel on. So I pedal everywhere, uh, outdoors, indoors, uh, even did half a marathon once. That is, that is awesome. Was that recent, the marathon? What no, was it was it? over 20 years ago now. I'm, I'm no, old. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Today I... I'm smarter. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, that is, that is very interesting. The, the, the way you constructed the, the wheelchair. Did you work with like a company in Sweden to, to create it or how did you go about creating that wheelchair? Well, we, we have public health care in, in Sweden, uh, free public health care, free um, aid, like wheelchairs. Uh, well, we pay it with our tax money, uh, but, but <laughs> it, it's free to everyone um, who needs it. So the first model they built at the, the, the tech part of the, the, the healthcare system. And then I find, found a guy who made this in titanium and bought it myself. This was, so it's lighter, quicker, more solid. So, Yeah, I, I saw a couple of your interviews and I just saw how swift you were. <laughs> that is really awesome. I don't have time if I'm slow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I need to speed up. <laughs> you are a busy man. So I did want to talk a little bit about your Paralympic career as well. So mm-hmm. when you first started swimming, you, you were saying that you didn't necessarily start because you wanted to like win like competitions or anything. It was more of just um, exercising. But when did you decide to switch over into the competitive portion of, of swimming? Well, I, I had a swim ring till I was 12. But then the world championships in, in uh, para swimming, as we call it now, that in 86, it was held in Gothenburg, Sweden, my hometown. And I saw so many people who were amazing with their disabilities. Uh, they became my, my heroes. Um, I saw one guy from uh, Great Britain who 
had no arms and no legs. He was a quadruple amputee, and he won the world championship gold in the class for the people with the most severe disabilities. So he was a world champion, and I had a swim ring, and it didn't feel right when I had both arms and legs. So he actually came up to the spectator seats one day and sat down with us, and he said to me, he showed the medal. I was 12, he was 25. He said to me, if I can do this, so can you. Mm -hmm. which makes it very hard to say it's easy for you to say right so, so I, I i just had to try afterwards um so it took me half a year to learn how to swim and then it i loved it because with my severe amc that that i do have i never won anything i was very i mean i was always lost um and needed help but and i didn't bother but but in swimming i enjoyed the fact that i could get better every day without becoming the best every I, I could take times on my lane i could see how much i improved um i didn't bother if i came last or second to last as long as i did a personal record and that that mental attitude gave me 14 world records and and three world championship goals uh two paralympics i never cared about becoming the best. I have three world championship gold from one competition and one of them doesn't mean so much to me because I didn't do a good time. I was lucky not to get beaten. I should, I wasn't happy with, the, with the, the, the race, but I have a sixth position in breaststroke that I'm extremely proud of without a medal because I did a personal best. I, I think, especially with disabilities, we can improve every day but I don't see why we have to beat everyone around us. I don't see why my value would be better if I beat you. Mm -hmm. My value as a, as a person, as a human is the same, regardless if I compete or not. And I am not prouder by beating you, but I am prouder if I beat myself yesterday. And, and look at subjective progress and success instead of objective success. And, Maybe people would, will think now when they see this, yeah, well, it, it is easy for you to say with all the success that you had in your life. But I mean, my biggest accomplishment as a swimmer was learning how to swim. <laughs> if I wasn't proud the day I learned how to swim, I would never find the motivation to train more. And in the end, 13 sessions a week, five hours a day. I, I would never find the motivation if I wasn't proud. Regardless if I had taken a gold or not. Yeah my body would be the same after that training mm -hmm. and that's what mattered not the medals exactly so transitioning from your paralympic career into your parliamentary work what was that transition like after i retired from sports i, I did public speaking i started many companies uh everything from clothing brands to to lecturing books uh mobile tech company so I, I did a lot of for 10 years and then i got asked if i didn't want to run for parliament in sweden so I, I ended up as a deputy mayor of my hometown gothenburg sweden's second largest city i did that for eight years and then i felt that i had learned so much over these years and i got so much support from people around me that i i've traveled so much uh, as a paralympian as just on vacation and i've seen so many different possibilities in the world for people with disabilities, which really affected me. Mm -hmm. I've been in countries where people are locked up in institutions, tied to their beds, just because they have one hand missing. Um, and that is the world today. And I felt that I, if I could contribute in any way, I need to try. So I wanted to run for parliament. Well, European parliament is kind of like your Senate. So in the US, I would be a senator. That would be my title compared to now a member of the European Parliament. And I wanted to be a voice for those who cannot be heard, which is people with disabilities. But it's not only them. It's only also children mm -hmm. everywhere. Children are suffering all over the world. So I am the chair of the European Parliament's intergroup for children's rights all over the world. I, I serve in the Committee on Foreign Affairs. I serve in the Committee on Human Rights. And I have never felt prouder at my work, and I have never had more fun doing it, even if it's some days horrible, terrible, that you, you 
You see things that still make you cry. But now I can make a difference. And in terms of the Swedish culture, how is um, the perspective on disability specifically? Is there a movement for creating accommodative infrastructure or what is that development like? Well, in, in Sweden, Sweden is one of the countries that I reached farthest within the European Union, probably the farthest yeah. when it comes to personal assistance, when it comes to getting help from the, 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 the government, even if we now for the last seven years have experienced quite bad cut, cut downs, uh, economical cuts, uh, which I hope that we'll remove after next year's election again. But th that, that has, even with that, we, we have a lot of support for people with disabilities. We, we don't have the same accessibility laws as, like we don't have the ADA um, as you do in, in the US. We, instead, we have the, the, the physical help of getting in. Not every bus is, is adapted. Not every store has uh, an accessible toilet. So we can learn a lot from each other. I think we could get a lot better here with your laws that you have in the US and you need our support systems. I would say that instead of looking at the other system as better, we need to see both systems' advantages and disadvantages. I, I do agree there. I usually ask that question from anyone from, from any country. Even myself with a disability, I'm, I'm always wondering if I'm able to have that accessibility or just wondering how to kind of go about in each country. It is important and we all have our part to play. I mean, we shouldn't rank them. They, they both matter. Definitely. That's so important. The last thing I did want to um, speak with you about is parenthood. Personally, I, I always dream of having a family of my own, but I've never really had any sort of anecdotal experience from or stories from other parents who have disabilities with arthrogryposis. So I was just kind of wondering, how did you kind of navigate becoming a father and, and navigate, you know, taking care of your child with a disability? Trying, playing, and sometimes failing. Like, like with everything else in life, if you know what I mean. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's an incredible journey. Um, and I have an amazing wife, uh, amazing daughter, and we, we make such a great team. But, it, but it's still, of course, it's a dream. It's a dream for, for everyone who, who dreams of becoming a parent, regardless if it's uh, a person with AMC or not. But, but still, I think that the, the, the worry was probably more in my head than, than my wife's in the beginning. What, what can I do? Can, can I do everything like a normal father would do. But we found ways. And now my daughter turns one in just a few weeks. And awesome. I think that the, the, first, the first months were quite easy because then I could place her on, on my chest and hold her for like, like the first two, three months. And, and I could hold her while my wife was fixing things. And, but then from probably two, three months until just a few months ago, one, two months ago, I couldn't do much because she was wiggling and moving and I couldn't secure her the same way. But now, now when she understands me, now when she listens, when she crawls and climbs up and stands up against towards me leaning, she starts delivering books and toys to my feet so I can read books to her instead of giving them to my hands. I mean, she, she totally got it uh, by herself. She never raises her arms towards me so I can lift her up but she always comes and climbs against my legs and tries to lean. Uh, and that's an amazing feeling. Was that surprising how she kind of understood the, the dynamic of disability? I think that for her, th this is normal. Yeah. This is normal. For her, mothers carry and, and fathers read books by the, with their feet. <laughs> that's her normal. Um, mm -hmm. She has no idea about something else, anything else. So what is the one thing that, let's say, if I become a parent soon, <laughs> um, what is the one thing that you would kind of advise or, you know, provide your wisdom with in becoming a father? Stop taking advices. Oh, okay. Find, <laughs> find, your, own, find your own way. Because <laughs> sometimes with advices, we start treating them as truths. That since, since, since David said it, it must be right. 
or if someone else said it, it must be like that. I mean, it's your life. You, your uh, both physical abilities, but also other uh, abilities and your uh, advantages, disadvantages. You, you need to find your way and trust that. I mean, I have no idea on how you face your disability every day, just as you have no idea about mine. We, we are unique. Yeah. So, so, and that's a general misconception or misunderstanding in society today. We finally grasp that everyone is unique, right? Mm -hmm. But we still think that there are top five advices that will help everyone. And that is pretty impossible if we all are unique. Definitely. Wow. So, I feel like this is a motivational speech for me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, find your own way. No. And trust that even if you fail, that's when you learn. Well, um, overall, thank you so much for speaking with me, David. Um, you are um, just a wonderful human being, and it's just been a pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much. You. <laughs> but, but also, I really want to say, Brandon, thank you for, for creating this document, this, this video. I looked up your channels. You, you do an amazing job. You're, you're such an inspiration to so many people. So don't stop. C continue doing it. So... Mm -hmm. Let's stay in touch. Likewise. But thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one, David. You too, Brandon. Take care.